DDoS ili distribuirani denial of service napadi odavno su svakodnevica na internetu. Iako operatori uložu dosta napora da većinu ovih napada ne primetimo, to ponekada nije moguće. Jedan od jačih takvih napada zabeležen je početkom novembra u Srbiji. Ova tema očito je više nego aktualna i upravo na temu suočavanja sa DDoS napadima govorit će nam sledeći gost, gospodin John Brown. On dolazi iz američke kompanije Team Camry, koja je sa tradicijom od skoro dve decenije globalni lider u oblasti mrežne bezbednosti. And now, Mr. Brown, after all this, which you never understood, please take your, take your place, place in the... In the, in the yeah. Oh, you have, you have, you have, you have, I have a, a co-speaker. Oh, you have a co-speaker. Yes, okay, co so thank you for joining us live today. You have 30 minutes. We'll check for questions, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Enjoy. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. All right. So I'm going to warn you guys and gals first. I'm an interactive presenter, so I will come and talk to you. I will move around. So part of the reason I do that is it's right after we had lunch, right? So what happens? The food goes to our stomach. The blood from our brain goes down to our stomach. We fall asleep. So I'm going to keep you guys invigorated, I hope. Uh, we're going to talk about community tools that exist for DDoS mitigation and to help network security. My presentations generally start off simple because I don't know my audience that well. If you all start going, yeah, 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 we know this stuff, then I start getting into more technical and more depth. So feel free to feedback. A lot of times presentations are questions at the end. If you've got a question that you really want to ask now in the presentation, raise your hand, throw something at me, jump up and down, whatever you got to do to get my attention. Let's ask that question while we're in the moment of what we're talking about before it gets to the end. Okay? Uh, let's see. Where do I need to point for the clicker? There we go. Um, I do a lot of different presentations in different cybersecurity and other... Uh, venues, so I have my standard slide up here about security classification of this presentation. Using first.org, does everybody here know what first.org is? If not, go to first.org and look it up. It is very important. You understand that organization from a cybersecurity is one of the oldest cybersecurity groups in the world. Anyway, we have a thing called TLP, Traffic Light Protocol. This basically describes what level we can discuss things, right? So TLP red means that only she and I will talk about it, and she can't tell any of her friends. She can't tell her mom, her dad, her boyfriend, girlfriend, boss. Nobody is just between us. That's TLP red. TLP clear is you can tell anybody you want. I don't care. And we have other colors like TLP yellow and TLP green, TLP white. If you want to know more, go to first.org slash TLP. If you want to take pictures of these slides, please do so. I don't care. The presentation will be available later. If you don't get it from RSNOG, find me. I'll be happy to send you a copy of the slide deck after the presentation. If you want to take pictures, uh, just be respectful and maybe not get other people's face in the pictures if you're going to post it to social media or post it somewhere else just because. Uh, so who am I? I am a CISSP, uh, Certified uh, Information Security Professional. I also am a commercial pilot. I fly airplanes for fun. I do cybersecurity to pay for my addiction of aviation. I work for Team Cymru as a senior cybersecurity evangelist. I've been doing the internet for about 35 years or so, uh, back all the way to 1984. In the very, very early days of ICANN, back in the days of Mike Roberts and Louis Teuton and, and so forth, uh, I worked with uh, John Crane and ran uh, LROOT DNS for ICANN. Um, I'm passionate about helping other service providers. I ran an ISP business for 17 years. I sold it to my employees last year, and now I hope to take my knowledge and share it with other ISP and network operators over the world about how to build a better, safe, and secure network. I used to do Microtech instruction. Uh, I was a Microtech instructor. I know Microtix really well. I know Juniper is really well. I still think I remember stuff about Cisco as well. Uh, like I say, when I'm not flying, I enjoy, uh, when I'm not working rather, I enjoy flying airplanes. If you want to get a hold of me, I'm jbrown at cymru.com, C-Y-M-R-U.com. Uh, let's see, push the right button. Dink. So who is Team Cymru? How many people in here have heard of Team Cymru before? Raise your hand real quick, just so I get a sense. 
Okay. Basically, we are a cybersecurity company that does threat intelligence and information security. We are 15 plus years old, 160 some odd employees. We're based globally. We have a commercial side and we have our outreach, which is our non-commercial side. I work on the non-commercial side. We do a lot of stuff for free or no cost. A uh, lot of services for certs, um, for ISPs, hosting companies, uh, et cetera. And we're going to talk about one of those in the technical side of that uh, today. Uh, here's a bunch of stuff on our various other no-cost community. I'm not going to sit here and read through this. I'm not doing a sales presentation. If you want to talk more about it, find me in the hallway. These are some cool things that we do. Uh, let's see. This trying to figure out where I need to point. There we go. Um, if you're a CERT, uh, we have some cool stuff for you guys. We do conferences, four of them a year. There's beginning some conversation of maybe we'll have one of those conferences here in Belgrade. There was an interesting conversation about that last night, but I can't talk any more about it other than that. But it'll hopefully happen. Um, we provide Dragon News Bites, which is really cool. This is a curated private invite mailing list. If you want to know about things that are happening cybersecurity wise, but don't have the time to filter through all the junk, subscribe to this. It's free. We filter through the junk and get stuff that's relevant. All right. So now we got the slides out of the way that I have to say because, well, somebody had to pay for my trip. My boss paid for me to be here. So I got to say something nice about our company. Um, what is a DDoS? Anybody in this room does not know what a DDoS is. Raise your hand, please. Do not feel afraid. Okay, so everybody knows what a DDoS is. The distributed denial of service. It's an attack against network resources, right? Basically, I'm coming up, walking right over to this gentleman here. I've got my fire hose, and I'm going <laughs> to spray lots of water at him. Can he talk right now? No. Can he do anything? No, because he's getting hosed, right? He's getting completely flooded with traffic. We're either trying to flood the resource, the network resource, or we're trying to consume resources on a server. So we have amplification attacks, which is basically the proverbial water hose. And we also have uh, uh, application attacks where, for example, we're sending out a whole bunch of SIN requests rapidly, and we're going to use that to consume resources on a server. Because when we send that SIN request out, we are building resources, we're consuming resources on that server for this potential new connection that happens. And that's part of how the D TCP three-way handshake works. And so we consume uh, resources there. Um, either way, the goal of a DDoS is to kill that service. Clicky. So quick picture. There we go. I got to figure out, this thing's an infrared, I think. So you have all your network. You've got your server over here. A gentleman just before me was talking about financial, financial services. So here's your money.com server. We're pushing traffic across the internet. Did that do it? I'm trying to figure out what the infrared sensor is. There we go. Okay. So our malicious actor sits there and takes over a bunch of computers and causes those computers to send out an attack. And so off that attack goes. And pretty soon our server falls over. DDoS. So question, who's the victim? Who's the victim? That's a question out to the audience. Who's the victim? Is the victim the website that got taken down? Yes? No? Is the victim the upstream internet provider to that website? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Why? Because they're taking most of that traffic. Pardon? Everybody. Everybody's the victim. Exactly. Thank you, Zorn. Everybody's the victim. All the way back to where those bots are, right? So everybody is, is a different victim in different parts of this network. So how do we mitigate DDoS? Well, the traditional way is we put an access control list in place. We filter out traffic, but the DDoS is still mitigated, right? I mean, it's still taking place. It still happened. That infrastructure is off the air, as we'd say. And putting in access lists may not scale well if you've got lots of routers out there. You can subscribe to a scrubbing service. 
a scrubbing service will, via BGP, redirect your traffic over to the scrubbing service. They will scrub the traffic, make it nice and clean and shiny, and then send it back to you via probably a GRE tunnel. That's great for application layer. It's even pretty good for uh, amplification attacks, volumetric types attack. You do have some issues with latency because you've got the redirect over to the scrubbing center and then the pull back through the GRE tunnel. And you might not have a complete control over your network routing and the network flow that you would like, but hey, you're up and running. So that's a good thing. Typically, a scrubbing service is going to be a paid service and you typically need to have this set up in advance. You can't necessarily say, at the moment of attack, call up a scrubbing service and say, hey, can you get me up and running? In part, because if, you're, if your network providers are doing their job correctly, ergo, they're following manners, um, if they're doing their job correctly, they're going to want a letter authorizing them to announce your routes, correct? Because otherwise, what control do we have over who can announce routes or who cannot announce routes. So you've got some paperwork and administrative things that need to get done before you can get necessarily a uh, scrubbing service up and running. Another way is to do what we call a remote triggered black hole. This is where Zorin is my upstream provider and I send him a specially formatted BGP message uh, with a prefix that I want him to drop and I put a community string on it. And that community string tells his BGP filter to go ahead and kill the traffic coming to that IP. Okay, so what did we just do there? We've just cleaned up my pipe between me and Zorn. I'm no longer suffering that volume. I'm no longer watching my 1 gig or my 10 gig or 100 gig or what have transit link get consumed. But I sure hope Zorn's got the capacity behind him to absorb because all that traffic is still coming to him. So here's what a, re a real-time black hole take, uh, picture looks like. The victim AS sends out a message to the upstream. The upstream turns around and stops the traffic. So now what we have is this piece is good and is no longer impacted. These pieces are still impacted. And this provider is still having to consume that traffic. Bert. He, he couldn't handle his um, uh, brandy. <clears throat> what if we could t do all of this, but instead of trying to solve the problem at the egress of the network where the attack is coming, what if we could do this where we are solving it at the ingress to the network, where the malicious packet originates from and comes into the network? What if we could have a thousand plus other network operators worldwide stop that traffic on the ingress with a simple BGP announcement? And so we can. And so we have a free service, it's a community service, it's called Utters. And what we do is you sign up, you give me a list of your routes, I validate that you are authorized for those routes, and I put that in my database. When she gets attacked, she can announce the slash 32 towards us, and we will tell all the other ISPs that are a member of the community to stop the traffic. Now, what actually happens there? So let's talk about the mechanics of that, because you can take this mechanics and you can use it in your own network, even if you don't subscribe to the other's service. There's some really cool features here. So the first thing is, is that we're going to use BGP as a signaling protocol. So that's going to be our control plane as opposed to a data plane. So we're going to use BGP for our control plane. She sends me that IP address. I validate it in my database. Maybe she has RPKI. Maybe we're going to do the checks with RPKI and Aurora's and make sure that, that that's good and is properly signed. Once we have it, we then redistribute it. So I send it out to this gentleman because he's subscribing to the service. He will receive this BGP announcement, and he has a, a, a policy statement, speaking Juniper, or a route map, speaking Cisco. And that policy or route map says, when I receive a route from the other's service, 
from that BGP peer. So this is an import rule. I am going to set next hop to dev null. I'm going to set next hop to, z to basically black hole. Now the value of doing that in most modern routers today is that when I set that next hop in my routing table and my rib and fib recalculate, what happens? That route now becomes a wire speed route in the ASIC that goes straight to hardware. Has anybody logged in and written an access control list? No. Have you worried about a technician logging into a router at 2 in the morning and making a mistake? No, you haven't. It's all automatic. It all happens via BGP in a pre-configured setup. Now, any traffic that is in his network, so all of his customers behind him are now sending traffic or were sending traffic because they've been hacked to her. Right, their routers in the distribution network comes up here to his core, boom. His core says next hop, throw it on the floor. It never leaves his network. It never goes out, she never receives the packet, and all the ISPs in the middle never have to process that packet. But there's also a really cool feature. How many of you folks have used unicast reverse path forwarding, URPF? We've got one hand. How many know what URPF is? Raise your hand. Okay, I got a couple hands. All right, so let's let's take a let's take a sidebar. I got I got a couple minutes, I think. Let's take a sidebar real quick on what is URPF? Unicast reverse path forwarding. It is part of BCP 38. BCP 38 is best current uh, policies or procedures. Um, 38 comes out of the IETF. If you don't know what BCP 38 is, I strongly encourage you to read it. It's about 20 years old. I say that because we should all know it. So what is unicast reverse path forwarding? Well, let's first of all make sure we quickly understand how a router works. A router, does a router look at the source IP address when it's making a decision? Yes or no? No. no. Does a router look at the destination? Yes. Yep. Okay. So if I'm spoofing an IP address, I'm faking the source IP address coming from my home DSL router, I'm sp spoofing that IP, the router is not going to care about it, it's not going to look at that source, it's going to merely send it on. Unicast reverse path forwarding does a really quick check in hardware. So I will use my lovely example person here again. She is going to send me a spoofed packet, right? Now, the way I could prevent that is I could build an access control list that would prevent those and say only my IP addresses are going to be there. Well, that doesn't scale very well. But if I turn on unicast reverse path forwarding, I let hardware do it. So what hardware will do is it'll see the packet come in. It'll look at the source and it'll be like, so if I was going to send a packet to this source, would that packet go back down the interface the packet just came in on? And if the answer to that question is no, throw the packet away. If the answer to that question is yes, allow the packet through. A sidebar is coming back around to our stuff here with utters is, is that when you have a route in your routing table set to dev null or to black hole, Unicast reverse path forwarding mode loose will drop that traffic anywhere in your network because it's a route to zero. It's a route to nowhere. So now you've just dropped traffic in hardware coming from the subscriber out and from the outside coming in, you're also dropping that traffic coming from an IP address you don't want. We'll come back to you a little bit more with unicast reverse path forwarding here in a moment. So here's how our remote trigger utters uh, service works. Is this going to trigger? There we go. This is just a quick picture of, I think, everything I just basically mentioned. So our victim AS sends out a message. We send that message out to all the participants. All of those participants start blocking traffic and we start to clean up the network. Why should you care if the ISP in uh, Romania is free of this traffic? It's called network hygiene. 
It's called not being a stinky neighbor, right? It's called making sure that your network is clean because you're hoping their network will be clean too because it's a social contract. It's both of you agreeing that you care about the network and you don't want the network being dirty either way. So we upgraded Utters to version 2.0 and there's some cool facts in here that we want to talk about because these are things that you can also implement into your own networks. We now support more than just a slash 32. We support up to a slash 25, which handles uh, carpet bombing and things along those lines. We support V6, uh, flow spec, which is I'm going to talk a lot about, and RPKI validation. Um, did I hear somebody with a question? Nope. Okay. Redundant route servers. We now have multiple route servers. This is important for really big guys who want to peer with us, and we now have some of those really big guys peering with us so that those attacks can be mitigated better. V6 support, we now support V6 because we're seeing a lot of increase in V6, DDoS, and other kinds of attacks on a V6 network. 30 years later, V6 is actually starting to become relevant. <laughs> Flow spec. So in the original version, if we just simply announce a prefix and we drop traffic to that prefix, we've dropped traffic to everything to that prefix. But let's say she's running a web server. She's got a really cool, awesome web server. And that web server is not a DNS server, but she's being attacked with DNS traffic. If we use flow spec and we announce a flow spec rule via BGP, we now can say, please drop traffic to this IP using protocol UDP and port 53. So instead of dropping all traffic to her, we're going to drop traffic based on a specific set of criteria. UDP, port 53, this IP address. It means her web server continues to run because she's not a DNS server, she's a web server. So her web server continues to run and we're still dropping all that traffic um, out at the ingress to the network. We support uh, validation, so going out using RIRs, uh, you know, RIPE, Afrinic, APNIC, uh, Latinic, uh, and Aaron. So, key, one key takeaway here, there's several. One is, let's have good hygiene on our internet. Let's work at figuring out how to clean up the network, and let's work together to participate in helping keep our networks clean. It's important. Each and every one of us does our job to have good network hygiene. We won't have stinky neighbors. I don't know about you, but I don't like stinky neighbors. Whether that's sitting in, the, in, a, in a conference room or that's sitting packets on a network, right? Number two thing I want to say, back to unicast reverse path forwarding. So I used unicast reverse path forwarding in my network, not only to help me with what others did, but also for IP addresses that I got reputation data on that said these are 100% of the time bad IPs, I don't, want the, I don't want traffic to or from them. I would use a tool called ExaBGP. I would announce those routes into my network via BGP, and I had a filter that would cause that traffic to go disappear from my network almost instantly because I was leveraging the value of unicast reverse path forwarding. I could take a malicious IP that I knew was a command and control bot, I could inject that into the network via BGP and across all of my routers, all of my peering sessions, all of that instantly, that traffic to or from that IP would be dropped and would no longer go across my network. I built a little web interface that allowed my network technicians to put in IPs that we wanted to drop so they never had to touch my routers, my Juniper MX480s at the core and make changes. They can make changes in a web page that would export into a SQL database. That SQL database would get read. JSON would push it into ExaBGP. ExaBGP would push it out. And poof, that traffic was gone. Okay. If you want to talk more about how to implement that, hit me up. I'm happy to show you my configs. I'm happy to share that. It's a really cool way of being able to just drop traffic pretty much instantly. Here's the big ask. Please spread the word about this Utters unwanted traffic removal service and sign up bluntly. The more folks that are participating, 
the better we can mitigate DDoS attacks quickly and efficiently at no cost. We have over 1,500 participants now. We'd love to grow that. We're starting to work with some IXs, where it's going to become a feature service of the IX. Technically, we don't have much to discuss. We have some things we have to discuss policy-wise to make sure that who is going to announce that prefix from the IX. Is it going to be the IX peer, or is it going to be the actual IX? The authority to do that, things along those lines. Those are administrative layer 8 issues, but I think we'll be able to work through them. I encourage you guys to sign up. Uh, I encourage you guys to, uh, to spread the word. And I think I am done with those slides. And I stand for any kind of questions, comments, throw chairs at me, whatever. Yes, sir. I have two comments. Two comments. Uh, first. Hang on, we got a microphone coming. <laughs> ta -da, ta -da. Thank you. I see Trimo. Yeah. I have two comments. Uh, first, uh, RPF is not always uh, not, is not always a good solution because uh, in the real life we have uh, more and more traffic that is routed asymmetric. Sure. Uh, one example is if you use uh, some uh, DDoS mitigation service, mm -hmm. uh, you have that uh, incoming traffic going to scrubbing center and outgoing traffic is going independently. So if you turn on RPF, uh, you will lose your communication. Which mode of RPF? Which, which mode? There's two modes uh, of RPF. Unicast. I'm talking about Unicast RPF. Right. Uh, do you want, so, do you want, so do you want me to address that first and then you come uh, to your second or do you want to ask me I both? Send second. Okay. And uh, second comment, uh, with your solution, uh, you free uh, the capacity of unwanted traffic, but uh, you make the DDoS attack to be successful because if you just block the traffic toward the problematic IP address, which is the target of the attack, uh, this service will not be uh, available on the internet. Okay, so let me address, first of all, the unicast reverse path forwarding. So let me ask this first of all question, and I don't mean to be a, a smart aleck here or anything, but let me just ask this. Is there any one perfect solution on the internet? No. So unicast reverse path forwarding, I'm going to put on my I ran an ISP for 17 years hat. In 17 years of running an ISP with unicast reverse path forwarding on, on all of my edge interfaces in strict mode, I never had a problem because those edge interfaces were a single homed connection and there was no asymmetry coming from the house. The packet to the house went out the same link as it came back in, whether that was on fiber or that was on a microwave wireless link using Ubiquiti or Microtech or whatever, right? So strict mode on an edge link, I never had issues. If I turn on URPF strict mode on peering or transit issues, I 100% agree with you, you're going to have problems. If I turn on URPF mode loose, as opposed to strict, I don't have the problems. Loose mode doesn't say that it had to come in that exact interface. It's going to look in the routing table to see if that route exists at all. If that route exists at all in a routing table, with an exception, it will forward, it'll allow the packet to be forwarded. So you don't run into the asymmetry issues, which is why they, they added loose mode to the specification. The exception is if the route is in the routing table going to dev null or going to the bin uh, routed to zero basically, then RPF loose mode will cause the packet to drop because it's in the routing table, it says throw it on the floor. So I always encourage folks, if you're going to enable any kind of configuration on a network, first of all, test it in a laboratory. Understand what's going on. Routing engineering, network engineering is not a spectator sport. You can't just show up to the, put the, the, the football pitch and just watch. You have to actually be engaged. So strict mode, I agree on transit and peering, you're going to have a problem. Strict mode on, on subscriber-facing interfaces where you know that that path is single-homed, uh, is I, I never saw a problem in 17 years. Uh, number two with regards to with the other service, that's going to cause her to still be off the air. Yes and no, but now we get into a percentages discussion. 
if we do nothing, she's completely off the air because her link is attacked, her transit link's attacked, her transit provider is also having problems. But if Zorin over here now receives a request to drop traffic coming out of his network going towards her, then I've just knocked the problem down a little bit. And I do that with each individual network. I knock the problem down a little bit. And so maybe she's getting attacked by a whole bunch of people from Brazil with infected microtics, like which happened a few years ago. Well, if all those ISPs are members and they stop the traffic, okay, so she's not getting web hits from Brazil, but she's still getting web hits from the Balkans, which is probably where her website is mostly focused at, right? It's regional. So we're doing like the 80-20 rule. We're trying to figure out how we can best keep some or most of the service up and running. It's not a perfect solution, but the more we can drop traffic at the edge, the less victims there are all the way across. I get the pressure that we're running out of time. Do we have one more question capability? We have, we have one more online, but do we have another one from the, from the audience? No, nobody else from the audience? You nobody sure? Nobody else. All right, what is so our what? online question? Uh, Jovan from a big, a big Wet Forest. It's a part of Belgrade. It just sounds strange. Uh, says it's a great lecture and uh, asks, any thoughts on Slow Loris? On Slow Loris? Slow Loris. Slow Loris. Yeah. I'm not sure I am up to speed on Slow Loris. Uh, maybe Slobo can help me. Uh, he talks about Slow Loris. Lo slow Loris is an animal, but maybe something. Is this a, is this a slow t uh, sin attack? Yes. yes? Most probably, yeah. yeah. Thank you for the mic. Okay. Okay. There's so many names for so many different types of attack. <laughs> it's like, which one do I remember? And, and I'm old, so I suffer from CRS. Can't remember stuff. Okay. Uh, so, so a slow TCP or slow SIN, our service isn't necessarily going to be very helpful with that because it's a low, low speed or low volume attack. That's really going to be more something I think that you're going to need to have on a, uh, at the application layer. So you're gonna, there I would think that uh, a scrubbing service is going to be more helpful because the scrubbing service is going to be able to see the slow, slow tack of sins coming in and know and learn a pattern and, and drop that traffic and continue to pass on the good stuff. That's my off-the-cuff thought process. Okay. We're going to use a coffee break afterwards okay. to, to ask you some more questions. So if there is, are no questions anymore from the audience live, then I would call it a day for Mr. Brown. No. Okay. One applause for John Brown.